Okay, okay, let's get this thing started, shall we? Welcome back to my shop, everybody. Another Wednesday, another Renaissance Woodworker Live. This week, we are picking up where we picked up last week on cutting curves. But today, we're going to talk about refining those curves. Um, this has been brought up by a number of people over the, the months since I kind of started up this live stream again. So it's a whole other set of tooling. Um, really, as with anything, you have this kind of coarse, medium, and fine spectrum, certainly when you need to shape a curve, when you need something that is, you know, a deep curve like this, the most logical step is to start by sawing out the curve roughly. Then the next step comes in refining it back to your line, fairing that curve, getting it nice and smooth. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. So um, as with every week, my, uh, my commercial, um, if you are, interested in supporting my uh my efforts here uh, patreon.com slash renaissance woodworker that's where that all happens um thank you to my new patrons this week uh, always always appreciate that um yeah and certainly uh, i get a lot of questions from you guys as well um one thing that i usually forget to mention is i've got this whole other thing called the hand tool school it's been running for 10 years now it is exactly as it describes it's an online woodworking school dedicated to hand tool work um, as a little kind of promo to folks who come to the school from here, I have this discount code, 10% off if you use the code RWWLIVE. So enough commercials, let's, uh, let's move on. Let's let let's, the let's, actual shaping of the curves. Today, let's look closer at some of these tools. These are some of my favorite tools in the shop, actually. Um, for many, many years since I really started doing uh, the Renaissance Woodworker blog, way back when uh, you know, YouTube didn't exist, I've had a logo using a spoke shave. The Renaissance Woodworker logo includes a spoke shave, and that's because it is my favorite tool, hands down. I really, really like working with this tool. Um, and there's really a couple of ways that you can look at these. There are the low angle shaves, like these guys. And then there are, I don't necessarily want to call them high angle, but I would just call them the standard angle shaves. These are more, you know, close to the resemble a plane. They've got a sole and the blade sticks out through the sole. Whereas these guys, the shave, the blade itself is the sole. So it's a slightly different uh, action in using them. But one thing that these low angle shaves do is um, they do cut a much tighter radius. So if you've got a real tight curve, these are gonna be able to get in there a lot more. Whereas these shaves like this, that have certainly a short sole and they can go in through a tight radius. But for instance, this Lee Nielsen shave is a flat bottom shave and it is somewhat limited because of this flat sole. I have a Lee Nielsen round bottom, but it's not that much rounder than the flat one. In fact, a lot of times it can be hard them to tell, tell them apart at first glance. This vintage Stanley uh, 152 has a bit of, excuse me, 151 has some shavings stuck in there. <laughs> Here we go. This is the same type of idea. Um, really the difference between, I find this shave and this shave, um, this Boggs Lee Nielsen is just really, really well balanced. It's got a very, very tight mouth. I kind of consider this to be my smoothing plane of spoke shaves, but both of them function the, the same way, um, either pushing or pulling great for doing convex or concave curves, but certainly you're gonna have some limitations based upon that sole. They don't get into the really, really tight curves, even these low, um, low angle ones. This Veritas model, this fence can actually be reversed. So I've got, um, and the blade itself, even though that appears to be the sole, that's not actually the reference surface. The reference surface is the area just in front of the blade, or in this case, this fence right here. And there's that engagement angle where if you just run the shave on the blade, it's not gonna cut. But if you tilt to that engagement angle, the blade will start to grab and cut that way. Same thing with this uh, wooden shave made by Caleb James. There is this, um, in this case, a mulberry wear plate in front of it. And that is the engagement angle. The shave sits balanced on its sole, but a little push forward, you'll see that shave tilts forward onto that uh, wear plate. And that is the engagement angle, but it's very, very short. So they will cut into those curves. You can have a, a other weird variety of, of, of round bottom shaves like this uh, double guy. This is really 
very specific use. I actually use it for rounding items, specifically for rounding spokes, which is why it's called the spoke shave. But this is just an incredibly versatile tool to handle most of the curves you're gonna run into, uh, especially furniture sized curves, not rear wheel tight. This curve that we cut last week could be shaped with the spoke shave, probably the entire thing, the tighter radius here, you might have some trouble there and we could use a slightly different tool for that. Before I go to the really tight stuff, this is a compass plane. This is uh, specifically um, the, uh, the Stanley, um, what is this, the number 20, the Victory model. This is the one that I prefer over the, uh, the Record model. I like the feel of this. I like, instead of having the handles up higher like you find on the Record model, this one is, is lower profile. It feels more like I'm working with uh, something like a wooden plane. Um, the reason it's called the compass plane is you can adjust the sole. So I can shape this, you know, just like I, I would a compass by twisting this knob and change this into something that's going to cut a concave surface because it has a convex sole, or I can spin it the other direction and turn the sole concave so that now that it shapes a convex surface. The primary use for this plane is much longer flowing curves. Certainly we've got a longer sole. This is a equivalent to like a lot of smoothing planes. If you've seen the video I did on the dock chair last summer, I used this um, almost exclusively to shape the curve for those curved legs. If you've ever seen the kids table and chair product that I did for uh, Mark Spagnolo's Woodworkers Fighting Cancer, I use this as well for shaping the long curves on the legs. So if you have, say, uh, a table or something, and you wanna put long flowing curves on the table over maybe a 36 inch long leg, this is the guy. This is the perfect tool for that. The spoke shave could do it as well, but you're gonna find you're gonna have more difficulty fairing that curve, getting a nice consistent curve because you're dealing with a very short sole body here. It's the same reason we use a longer joiner plane to create a flatter surface over a shorter smoothing plane. This guy will ride over the humps and valleys and it will create you a more fared, more consistent curve. That's a great tool to have around if you deal with furniture sized parts that use curves at all. We'll look at that in just a second here. Um, I did talk a little bit about the, the draw knife last week as a potential tool for not only uh, cutting the curves, but it also can be used for shaping the curves just as well. Um, because we just have an exposed blade here. And if you work the blade bevel down, you've got quite a bit of ability to turn into tight radii. This is a little bit harder tool to use. It does require a little bit more practice. I often say that I myself need some more practice with this tool. It's also kind of a nasty, very, very sharp, just freshly sharpened blade. So I'm gonna put the cover back on it. Which leads me to, let me move my shaves out of the way here to the really, really tight curves. That's the domain of the files and the rasps. So I've got a whole drawer of these guys in my tool cabinet that um, I just pulled out here because it's a little bit easier. Um, rasps are gonna be your primary tool. Now rasps can be actual um, rough tools that could be used to actually uh, create a curve. So if you didn't have a turning saw, you could use a rasp. I wouldn't necessarily try to create a curve like this just with a rasp, that's a whole lot of dust. But you can get into some very coarse grained rasps. This is, oh, I can't remember now. This is a number six grain. This is a Lioge rasp. Number six grain is very, very aggressive. It will cut very, very fast, but these go all the way down to a number one grain. And if you're not familiar, the grain is the coarseness or the fineness of the rasp. Think of it like grit in sandpaper, you know, 80 grit, 120 grit. This is a six grain, very, very rough. This cabinet maker's rasp is what? A nine grain. And this is kind of your general all around jack plane of rasps. Um, I've got a slightly uh, finer Lioge rasp. This is a 12 grain little bit longer, more pointed, getting in for um, a little bit more uh, um, tighter curves, more detailed areas because of that nice point up there. But the idea being that there is a whole continuum. When you get below about a four grain, these become super aggressive and don't work real well on wood. They tend to like blow out huge chunks. And if you've ever seen a number one grain, they're really scary, like medieval looking teeth. 
This is, um, this is really as coarse as I've ever really wanted to go with a rasp. And if I've ever found myself needing to remove more material faster, I generally put this down and pick up a saw. Um, one of the more kind of modern tools, this is called a microplane rasp. And these are just little tiny plain teeth. This is hardened steel. I picked this thing up at Woodcraft probably whew, 10, 12 years ago. Again, it's called a microplane. I actually think that's the brand name. Microplane, yeah. These are really cool. They shape really, really fast. Um, it's got this curved blade. You can pop it out and put this flat blade in. I keep it around because it is a really beneficial tool for removing a lot of wood. But here again, if I wanted to shape a curve like this, it makes more sense to saw it out than tackle it all with a rasp. You can get into the finer stuff. This guy is called a modeler's rasp. This is actually the finest rasp that I own and I put it away without cleaning it. Bad me. Um, this goes, this is a 15 grain. This is as fine as the rasps go, at least according to, uh, this is an RU rasp. Leo J also goes as fine as uh, 15 grain. This is a 15 grain. Um, and I actually kind of prefer Leo J rasps over RU now because Leo J offers more profiles. This is a, a slim uh, needle file. Obviously you can see it's quite a bit slimmer than the modeler's rasp from RU, comes to a finer point. It also, uh, Leoje has the sapphire steel from a turning saw, and we can refine the scratch pattern and, and refine the curve, fare the curve using this rasp, then switch to this rasp and remove the coarser scratch patterns into a very fine scratch pattern. And this 15 grain rasp comes very, very close to leaving a finish ready surface. If the surface, like in the instance of this bench leg that I just covered up, this guy that I was showing you earlier, this surface has been refined using this 16 grain or 15 grain modeler's rasp. And I'm just gonna leave it that way because this goes to the floor. You're never gonna see this surface. It's nice and clean. I could actually grab some sandpaper from here and probably go straight to 180 or 220 grit to refine this. But if you have a curve that you wanna to take truly to finish ready surface, You've got to go one step beyond the modeler's rasp, and that's where we actually get into files. The file is, you know, the much, much less aggressive cousin to the rasp. A lot of times we tend to think of files in terms of metalwork, and that's where they are used a lot. I've got several files exclusively for sharpening my saws. This is a cabinet maker's file. This is a Nicholson cabinet maker's file. Um, it's got the round side and the flat side. This will take a surface from this modeler's rasp and it will polish it to a high shine and make it finish ready. You know, like way, way beyond 220 grit sandpaper uh, for this guy. This is another mill file, specifically flat on both sides. Um, you're gonna find these all the time in metal shops. You can also use them for wood. What I don't recommend is using the same file for wood and for metal. You wanna have a dedicated file for metal and a dedicated file for wood because you just the metal filings on your wood, not a good idea. The wood will clog up the metal file, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not a good idea to have both of them. I do have another file here. Um, for some reason, I haven't made a handle for this yet. But um, this, is, this is what we call a single cut file where the teeth just run in one direction. This is a double cut file where I've got this grid pattern where the, the teeth are cut one way and then cut at a diagonal to that, giving this kind of a diamond pattern. This will actually give you a slightly finer and easier cut than this guy. Um, I don't use this as much, which is probably why I don't have a handle on it yet. I find I can do most of the work I need with um, this, particular, this particular file. It does most of my refining work. You can get into some other shapes. Um, well, it's in the wrong drawer. When you get into the purely circular files, these are often um, for metalwork. This would be called a chainsaw file, what we use to sharpen a chainsaw. They also can be known as a rat tail file. This is an RU rat tail file. Like you see it comes all the way to a point and it is toothed all the way up to that point. Those teeth are stitched all the way up there. You can get into really, really tight spaces with this guy. Nice tool to have around. Um, this is what we would call a sawmaker's rasp. It's got that inside curve that kind of get inside the saw handle. Very, very nice. Um, 
These guys, I had a bunch of these and I sold some of them and kept the really fine ones. These are Iwasaki Japanese files. They all, will actually produce shavings rather than dust. They can create a really, really nice surface. I found that the rougher models, um, I picked these up at Woodcraft years ago, but I found the rougher models remove material very, very fast. And like I said, little tiny thin shavings, but they were kind of difficult to control. They stuttered a lot on me. Um, these fine files, really are much smoother to use and they do leave a very, very smooth surface. I actually find them a little bit smoother than I would generate from my um, modeler's rasp, this 15 grain rasp, so it's kind of a nice step, but they're also quite small. I've got a, a rounded shape and a flat shape and they're really beneficial to kind of get into tight little areas. Um, and then last week I also showed this uh, riffler, this Italian riffler file. This is a file, it's not a rasp um, and again, toothed all the way up to the points, get into really, really delicate areas. Um, for the most part, when I'm dealing with a lot of really delicate parts, I try to focus on getting the saw to cut really well and not having to clean up with the file of rasp. Um, these guys are actually floats. These are joinery floats. Um, I wouldn't really use these so much for shaping. These are flattening tools, but there was really no other place to put them on my tool cabinet. It made the most sense to put them there. So that's my, my file and rasp collection. It is, um, kind of been built up over time because I found that I can do most of the work I need with this cabinet maker's rasp and this modeler's rasp. Where I started adding other pieces was when I wanted something slightly longer, wanted something a slightly tighter point. Um, I did um, a mirror recently in the hand tool school that had some fret work on the side these little guys, these little fretwork pieces, and these are veneered. There's solid walnut with a walnut crotch veneer on the front. And I needed something really fine that wouldn't chip the veneer edge, but also could get into some of these inside areas. And that was where this rasp came from. So I just kind of added on as I've needed things. Rasps I think can be a little bit like carving tools and the fact that there's a whole bunch that you can that you can buy, but you're only gonna need you know a small fraction of them, kind of add them as you need them. The last thing in this drawer is something that um, Lioge developed in conjunction with Tom Fidgen. Um, these are Lioge rasps, but they're two-handled like a spoke shave. And the teeth, instead of being um, stitched along the long axis, they're stitched across the short axis. So it actually cuts as I push away or pull towards me like a spoke shave. And I've actually found these to be really beneficial for a lot of furniture work. If you wanna quickly rough in and shape something like a cabriol leg, this is fantastic because you're working down the long axis of the piece and it's a much more natural feel than trying to work across the grain and you can get a cleaner cut that way. Um, when when they um, Tom announced these, he had kind of a, it wasn't Kickstarter, but like a, a Kickstarter type thing that started with both a, a coarse, medium, and a fine. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure what the grains are on these. Again, these are made by Noel Leoge. They are Leoge Rast, um, but I'm not really sure what I would equate them to. This would probably be equivalent to about a 12 this is most likely a 15, and this is probably about a nine, more than likely. But um, they don't get as much use, but um, I did a chest of drawers project recently. They had curved feet on the bottom, and they were really kind of short, stubby feet, but they had a deep curve in them. This was perfect, you know, because the teeth, the teeth are cutting across this shorter section, they will clog up relatively quickly. You can't take super long strokes because there's so few teeth here. So, you know, for longer legs, they can sometimes be a little annoying because you've got to stop and kind of brush out the teeth and clean them up a little bit. For, for those shorter legs, this worked really well. Cleaning up something like this curve could be done really well with a rasp. In fact, I may even do that right now. So those are the primary tools. Um, I want to show some of them in use. So um, uh, let me know if you have questions about any of those tools, but I'm going to kind of move into... Uh, into actually showing the stuff work. But uh, there's a question that says, does the draw knife work like a chisel would? Well, yes, everything in woodworking works like a chisel. The chisel is the prototype tool. Everything wants to be a chisel. Um, a saw is a whole bunch of chisels lined up on, on the saw plate. A plane 
is a chisel whose blade is held at a fixed angle against the frog. Um, uh, rasp, you, you could make a case. A rasp has a bunch of little tiny teeth that act like a chisel. All the chisel is is a wedge. And the draw knife is a wedge with two handles on either side of it. It is a chisel with two handles on it. So everything in woodworking really can be traced back to the chisel. So easy answer, yes, it works like a chisel. They all work like a chisel. I used to joke when I was studying music, um, I was a vocalist, and we used to say that, you know, the first instrument was the human voice. And ever since then, every other instrument has tried to emulate that. And I used to really, really piss off the instrumentalists. <laughs> but if you look at like a trumpet or especially an oboe that has a double reed, what else has a double, has a double reed? The vocal cords. <laughs> The adduction of the vocal cords is very much the same as the double reed in an oboe. All the reeded instruments, clarinets, even the embouchure of a trumpet um, uses the same embouchure we use uh, in, with our lips. So yeah, I used to really make the, the instrumentalist mad when I say, well, you guys are just imitating us. <laughs> For the instrumentalists out there that know, most vocalists tend to be the, mm, the worst musicians when it comes to like understanding a music theory and stuff like that. So it really would tick them off when we'd say, well, you know, you guys are just trying to be like us. This, this curve is a little out of square, a little bit out of square. So when I sawed it, um, I must have tilted the saw a little and taken the thing out of square. That's fine. So what I would want to do is actually do a little bit of, I would call it sculpting, where I'm actually shaping the surface and sculpting it to get it closer to the final form. And then once I've got it sculpted square and sculpted close to the line, I want to refine it right back to the line and smooth it. And that refinement step is kind of removing the little lumps and bumps that may have existed from either the shave or the saw. So I'm going to start with my straight shave. And I think I'm going to use this guy to start with and just see how we cut. Now, obviously I'm using a shave here, so I need to pay attention to grain direction. But in general, when you're talking about curves and grain direction, I should probably center that on the, uh, on the work here. It's mostly not so much about grain direction, but about uphill and downhill. You don't want to work a shave uphill because no matter what you do, you're coming up underneath the fibers and you're lifting out of it. But if you work downhill, it doesn't matter if the board appears to have the grain rising up this way, I'm still working downhill. And you can see this is a pretty tight radii here. And it's not really cutting. The shave is riding over the surface. Let's go and... I can work the very bottom of this curve and this is also the fun part where you can work the bottom, but as you go too far this way, you'll start to get tear out because I'm starting to go uphill, which is why it's nice that you can very easily rotate the shave around. And you're fine there, but that's really all I can get with this flat shave. Let's try switching to the low angle. And now I can, I think I can pretty much hit this entire curve here. The key with these low angle shaves, these are incredibly powerful tools, um, is really finding that engagement angle. If I set the blade straight down in here, there is, there's a little bit of a rock forward. And I definitely find that spoke shaving is a fingertip operation. It's not a grip it in your fists because you lose the feel there. This is gripping it with your fingertips. And in fact, Caleb um, James that made this has done a great job of creating this little relief here that perfectly hugs your index finger and allows your, and actually there's a lovely little spot down here underneath where the thumb goes in. It's a very comfortable shave to hold. And with that fingertip grip, I can really get a feel for the curve. Both on the push and the pull. 
and shape almost all of that curve. I can't get into this little tight area here and I can't get into this tight area here. So I would need to go with a different tool here. Um, and I'm pretty certain I could, I could switch to my round bottom Lee Nielsen shave and I'm not gonna be able to get into that tight area. These, these shaves are gonna get into a much tighter radius than the round bottom um, flat shave like this. So I, I know automatically this is kind of my both this Veritas shave and this Caleb James are kind of my, let's see if this works and if this can't get in, then I know that I've got to switch to something like a rasp at that point. The only other thing that I didn't mention, scratch stocks can be used to shape curves. I mean, really what we're talking about is a glorified card scraper here. And with a card scraper, I could use a card scraper and get right in here and shape that curve. And I'm taking out the bumps. There's a little bump right there. And now with longer strokes, I can come back and fare that curve off and get is how would you put like a molded profile around a curve? If I wanted to put an ovalo or a bead on here, I could shape, this happens to be a beaded scratch stock. I could shape my bead or my, my um, scratch stock blade. Whoops, I should really tighten that in the block first. And I can use that to scrape a bead right into that profile. Let's see if we can pull out that detail. It's a little hard to see at that angle. So there's a, a little eighth inch bead now on the curve here, just done with this guy. So what I've got is, actually it's a bit of card scraper with a tiny little eighth inch diameter bead on, on the end of it. Works great. Uh, I've just got a block of wood and a, uh, uh, I tap the end of this. This is really hard marble wood. I tap the end and a knurled nut through there. I've also got scratch stocks that look like this. This is a, a long thumbnail profile, um, which by the way, having things like chainsaw files around for working metal is how one actually shapes these scratch stocks. I've got another much more complex profile in here that is a, um, a bead and quirk ovalo type pattern. Uh, I used this on a, on a picture frame one point and it fit into this scratch stock holder. Technically, this is the scratch stock. This is the scratch stock holder. And I was able to scrape the profile. Now you can use a scratch stock to create the entire profile. Like I can start with a square edge and create the profile with a scratch stock. You can do that, but it's a lot of work. Um, and you will probably end up dulling that scratch stock quite fast. The good news is, is sharpening a scratch stock is, is quite easy. It's just a matter of laying it flat on a stone and rubbing it back and forth and getting that 90 degree edge. The, the real most efficient way to use a scratch stock really should involve some shaping with another tool. My scratch stock drawer has gotten too full. It's hard to close now. Um, it sh should involve some shaping with another tool, sometimes just a carving gouge to kind of rough it to shape, and then you come back and refine it. So you're not having to remove a heavy amount. Same way when I stick moldings with hollows and rounds, I do the heavy lifting work with a rabbit plane, remove most of the waste, and then come in with the last like six, seven passes with a hollow and round to shape the bead or the, or the oval or whatever it is I'm doing. Um, on a curve like this, I would do the heavy removal work with something like a carving gouge and then come in and refine it. The good thing about a scratch stock is it can take all the little facets and all the little lumps and bumps that maybe you created with poor carving gouge skills and, and unify them and shape them all into one, which brings up the next point of what I really wanna to do to shape this tight radii here is switch to a rasp. So 
Oops, I put away all my rasps. What am I thinking? Let's use Cabinetmaker's Rasp. So I've done some smoothing with spoke shaves here, and I kind of dinged it up a little bit with the card scraper on the backside, but essentially I've got you know a finish ready surface here, but now I've got a rough sawn, literally rough sawn surface from the, the turning saw. So what I would do here is I would rasp into this corner. And the rasp is used, again, because the teeth are cutting along the long axis here, the rasp is used to cross the grain, um, sometimes called a draw file stroke. So I'm actually working across the grain, but what I will also do is rotate the tool to follow the curve. So there's two actions going at the same time. And ideally what I would probably want to do, drop this down a little bit take away some of the vibration closer to the to the vise. But with that, I'm shaping through the curve and that's allowing me, even though I'm cutting across the grain, I'm rotating it along the long axis here. So I'm smoothing out the lumps and bumps and fairing that curve. Now, this is a particularly tight curve and I'm actually running into issues with my wider, wider cabinet maker's rasp so I can go to the finer point of this guy and that'll get me right in there. I also need to kind of pull things square. I'm a little out of square. And that gets me much closer. Now, the one thing you're going to run into is you're going to get a little bit of fuzz on the backside of the cut. So if, say, this is the, the, the show surface, I want to work from the show surface back, if both surfaces are show surfaces, then you've got to take into account that you may have to do a little bit of cleanup on the face to clean up any fuzz. But as I move finer and finer on my rasps, I've got kind of a rough scratch pattern, but I've got the curve shaped, as I run my finger down the curve, I can feel there's no little stutter steps and bumps along the way, but it is still rather rough. So now I'm gonna come back with this modeler's rasp. And the goal here is to keep working until you don't see the previous scratch pattern. You're refining it with this lighter scratch pattern. And sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're not sure if you're there, I blow out the dust and you can kind of look at it from a couple of different angles. And if you see any kind of cross hatching pattern, it's generally some, it's almost like an interference pattern. You've got multiple scratch patterns going on, but I'm also seeing a nice smooth surface here and a rougher surface there, which tells me I don't, I haven't removed the full scratch pattern. I've got a little bit more work to do. So if the surface doesn't show up or appear as nice and uniform, you've got interfering scratch patterns and you have to just work it a little bit more and you can generally see it. You'll see it suddenly kind of come up to a higher shine um, as you move and unify that scratch pattern entirely. Now, this is still, if I can really pull out that detail or not, this is still, this is very smooth, nice and refined. Um, it looks really good, but poplar is also a little bit soft. So, you know, it could be a little bit rougher. So what I really want to do, if I wanted to take this to finish ready, is grab my, my file now, and I'm doing the same stroke. Draw filing across the board, but moving the file also along the long axis of the cut. And you can actually even skew things a little and start kind of working with the grain or downhill with the grain. Rasps don't really pay much attention to grain direction. I should mention that. But now you really will be able to see a shine come up. And 
a little bit of cleaning up there. And now I've got a dead smooth, actually reflective surface. If I looked at that in raking light, that is a finished ready surface just using this cabinet maker's file. So working through the grits like that is exactly the same process that you would use to work through the grits of sandpaper. You know, 80 grit, 120, 180, 220, et cetera, to get that fine finish. You can do the same thing without ever using sandpaper, just using rasps. Now in the end, the best surface I find is gonna be a surface from a bladed tool. So I really like to have as much of it cleaned up with a shave, but there's gonna be differences in the appearance. I'm gonna have a different look to the shave surface than one with the filed surface. And if we look real close at this, at kind of the, the glare, if you will, the shine coming off of this spoke shaved surface and compare it to the shine coming off the filed surface. They both look really good, but you can see this has just a little bit more glint to it. This is just, it's almost like this is a, you know, gloss versus the satin finish. They feel pretty much the same, but there is a slight difference there. And what you may run into, if you've had to use multiple tools to shape a curve, this is where kind of unifying those tool marks with the scraper can be really beneficial. Especially the points where you transition. I've got, you know, bladed cut all the way up to right here. And it's, when I look at it in the right light, it's very apparent. So I will often work right in that area and kind of blend that transition. And now, when I look at this, I've got the same kind of glint, the same type of finish, if you will, from one end of the curve to the other. It was just blended together using the card scraper. Now, in this particular instance, because this is a relatively short curve, um, it makes sense to use a shaping tool, a rougher, coarser rasp, to shape it back to the line, to fare that curve, and then just come in with a card scraper and finish the whole thing up. I mean, there's so little, so little real estate involved here that it doesn't really make sense to kind of work up through the grits. But you will find some instances where it can be very difficult to get a card scraper in. You know, this um, uh, chair maker scraper from Bearcat uh, has some cool curves and shapes to it. I've also got some gooseneck scrapers that get into nice curves and things. But if you're in a captive area, like, you know, a fretwork area like this, you can't get a scraper in there to do anything. So you've got to rely upon files, riffler files and things like that. This surface is very much a show surface. And I don't know if you can see, but it is, it is finished ready. And I had to use my modeler's file and or excuse my modeler's rasp and my files in order to get those surfaces. You could do a little bit of scraping on the outside, but certainly I couldn't get into the inside with the scraper. So it's, it's a really, it's a game of playing with a bunch of different tools to come up with the, um, the right finish ready surface. Somebody asked, uh, is there a way to tell the grain of a rasp in a vintage rasp? They were for the most part punched up by the handle but sometimes that just goes away. I mean, even on my, um, some of my modern rasps, it's just hard to see because it's really, really faint. One thing I recommend is if you go to, um, to the Lioge website, it's French, L-I-O-G-I-E-R, go to their website. They actually have some photographs of the different grains, the sizes of the teeth. I think the Fine Tool website has them as well. But they've got pictures that show what one through 15 grain looks like and you can kind of eyeball whatever rasp you're looking at and kind of get a feel for it. But in the end, it doesn't really matter what the number is. What does the surface look like? You know, if you're working a piece and it's generating a rough surface, it's probably not a 15 grain. And there isn't a lot of standardization in these as well. Like if you were to go to Gramercy, Tools for Working Wood, and buy one of their rasps, they use a totally different 
um, grain system. I don't think they even call it grain. I can't remember what they call it now, but it's a different, uh, it's a TPI is what they call it over there. So um, it, it really, it, it go by the effect, you know, and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it a 28 grain. It doesn't really matter if it's leaving a really, really smooth surface. That's a good call. But if you're totally clueless, use the, um, use the photos on the OJ website um, to kind of give you a, an idea of what you're looking at. Um, that will definitely get you in the ballpark. I've done that before. Uh, other questions? I believe Caleb does make wooden planes. I think most of his stuff is, is um, I don't know that it's special order, but he builds certain lots and you buy while he still has them. So uh, if you're making an oval top, how would you work the curve on the end grain? Exactly the same way that I just worked the curve on this face grain. If you're using rasp, they don't file a thumbnail profile on the other side. So I shaped as much as I could. The face grain was obviously a lot easier to shape with the spoke shave. It started to get a little bit more difficult on the end grain. So what I ended up doing was using my rasp to shape the majority of the thumbnail profile. And then I came back with a freshly sharpened spoke shave to kind of clean that up and, and unify the shape there. But that's the beautiful thing about files and rasps is they really don't care about grain direction. So in grain, face grain, whatever, you can use them to shape curves. Oh, and um, somebody asked about the draw knife. Is the draw knife pay attention to grain uh, like a chisel? Absolutely, absolutely. So what's the difference between left and right-handed grasp? Exactly that. The teeth are cut to be angled slightly. Obviously, when I am cutting with, this is a left-handed RU rasp. When I'm cutting, I'm cutting at an angle. I can even work straight across my body, but I still, even if I'm working straight across, there is a slight angle to my approach here just because of the way I stand. If I come straight out, I have to kind of stand out of the way and this is not effective. My body is way out. It's, it's kind of cantilevered out. My greatest force transfer is squaring my shoulders off, and that that does is turn the rasp. If I go to my right hand, the, the teeth are not quite in the optimal direction. They're angled the wrong way. They're angled correctly in the left hand like this. Some rasp makers don't make them left or right-handed. They just make them kind of straight on. Gramercy is one of those makers that doesn't have left or right-handed. Um, the OJ does do left and right-handed um, when it's a nice little feature because I am left-handed, and a lot of the vintage rasps that I run across don't cut all that well, but I say this with a lot of hand tool woodworking, it's a good idea to develop a certain amount of ambidexterity because you'll find yourselves needing to change on the same piece, you know, and get a better angle on something by changing to your right hand or your left hand. Plus it's just years growing up as a left hander in a right handed world, you just get used to doing things with your other hand. It's either that or you, <laughs> you won't succeed very well because everything is made for the right handed people. Having a stiff bristle brush, this is actually a fingernail brush. Very good thing to have around. Keep your rasps clean um, before you put them away and clean them often because they'll actually stop cutting as they clog up, much like a saw. If the gullets fill up with dust, they, they don't cut well. So um, last thing I wanna do is the compass plane because this is a particularly fun tool to work with. Um, let's shoot a nice curve. <laughs> So we're going to shape the curve, starting with the draw knife. Whoops, let's just drop that. Guys who are talking about sound issues, I can't imagine why sound matters when I change from one camera to the other because it's the same audio. There's only one audio source on there right now and it's this lav mic. Um, the cameras themselves are not inputting audio, so I can't imagine what's causing the change. There is a millisecond delay that seems to have changed with YouTube recently. Um, I just changed it when I did a um, hand tool school session and it seemed to work well, so I'm using the same settings. I can't imagine what the issue is. It's really annoying that 
it seems to be different. See, now here's an instance where I'm actually working against the grain with the draw knife. Um, I'm just shaping here, so I'm going to just push a little bit with the draw knife. But you also can skew the cut a little, kind of fool it into working. But since I'm just trying to rough in a shape, the other thing is once I start creating a downhill, so I was cutting against the grain, but as I start to create more and more of a curve and go more, more downhill here, I'm now working with the grain again. It's like I was saying earlier where it's not so much grain direction to the board, but uphill and downhill best on a continuous radius. This is an asymmetrical curve, steeper here, longer there. You can do both, but it requires a little bit more finesse, not finesse, that makes it sound like I'm really talented. It requires a little bit more paying attention um, as that radius changes. The other thing about a compass plane is like the spoke shave, like anything, you don't necessarily want to work uphill with it. So I often see a lot of people running the full curve with a compass plane and you can still get tear out as I go up this hill, I'm going to be working against the grain. So a lot of times what I'll try to do, the grain of this board is running in this direction. So even though I'm running uphill, I'm going against the grain because I'm going uphill, but the, the predominant grain direction is the direction I want to go. So I can kind of stack the cards in my favor and I can take a full length pass with a compass plane, even though I'm going a little bit against the grain. There, the other aspect here is baby steps. What I want to do first is shape this curve. I want to smooth out the curve. I've got a whole bunch of facets on here right now from the draw knife. I want to smooth it out, fare it into a consistent curve, and then I can worry about removing any potential tear out that comes up. So up until then, I want to be cautious. I don't want to just be, you know, pulling out huge chunks of tear out. And I can do that by making sure my blade is sharp and by taking a somewhat lighter cut. Um, but the thing I want to look at here is I will just set my plane right on top. And I'll turn it. I'm changing the sole to concave. And I'll specifically go over so that the blade is not touching. And then I'm going to flatten it out a little until the blade touches and I start to see the toe just kind of pull away from the work a little. The compass plane is not really meant to set a radius. So if I knew that I was shaping a six inch radius, six inches is a bit small. I was shaping a 18 inch radius. I could technically measure this and set that, you know, uh, to a template or something like that and set that radius. But the fact is you want the curvature to be a little bit in the case of, of a convex surface, an outside curve, you want the curvature of the sole to be slightly wider than what you're going for. So if I needed an 18 inch radius, I would set this to be you know, 18 and an eighth inch or 18 and a quarter inch, slightly wider. And the opposite applies for a concave radius, an inside curve. I want the radius to be a little bit tighter so that you're getting the blade to bite throughout, especially in this early stage when I'm just shaping this. I'm not trying to, to match a specific curve. I want to remove the bumps. So I need the plane to be touching throughout. So that's the first thing to pay attention to is you want to not just set that specific radius and you wonder, you'll get to a point where it'll stop cutting. And I've got the majority of my shaping needs to happen right here on top. But once I really get those bumps out, now I'm starting to get shavings or more consistent shavings. It's a little bit harder right down here at the end because that radius is quite a bit tighter. So I'm going to finish shaping here. And now
angled it up a little so not running into my bench. For here, I'm going to tighten the radius on the sole a little bit more. Because the problem with the looser radius I was using over here is it was kind of rocking. It was getting hard to get the plane to register. But now with a tighter radius, I can use the toe of this to kind of hug the wood. And I can cut just in that one area. And now I've got a perfectly smooth radius. It's not a constant radius. It's a tighter radius here. It's asymmetric and it flattens out here. But as I run my finger over this, it's perfectly smooth, not just smooth as in, you know, no tear out, but there's, it's fair. It's no lumps and bumps and that, I mean, you could just see the profile of it looks much prettier. And this is really where this plane shines. I could try to do the same thing with the spoke shape, but you're going to find that it's going to run through those little hills and valleys. It's going to take a lot more work, a lot more spot planing work to remove those, to get it into the kind of that flat-ish state. Whereas this, as you saw, when I first started, I was getting skipping here and there, skipping here and there, just like a joiner plane would. Um, and then it started to take those full length shavings. And now I've got a lovely curve. I had to make one adjustment to change for this tighter radius over here, but really that's pretty. I like that curve. I should do something with that. So yeah, that's the compass plane in action. Um, is a bastard cut rasp or file intended for wood or metal? Bastard cut refers to um, how the file is stitched, not um, wood or metal. So it can be used for both. Um, I think you're going to find probably more often that it's used for wood because of it's a little bit rougher cut. Um, whereas one would say a mill file which is a single cut file, is going to be used more for, for metal. But they both cut both well. Um, the, the, the key is not moving from one to another, not using the same file on wood uh, as you would on metal because you get cross-contamination and you'll end up with metal filings in your wood, which is going to end up you know, dulling your compass plane blade later as you go back over it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but no, it's not nearly necessarily. You can pick up any file or any rasp and use it for either metal or for wood. Just don't use it for both. Did I miss any questions further up? I don't think I did. So with that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of other things you can do to shape curves. There's a lot of other little, you know, tips and techniques, but I've found those are the tools that I use primarily. And, and honestly, the, the compass plane, I didn't use nearly as much. I've just started kind of, that started becoming a favorite tool again very recently. Um, and I think a lot of it was I just didn't have the projects um, that had nice long flowing curves. And I just found that it was too much trouble to take it out and set it up for a short curve. But um, yeah, like I said, that, that dock chair that I built recently is a perfect example of uh, of a nice furniture curve that's good for the compass plane. So yeah, if any other questions come up, feel free to, to leave them in the comments or we can certainly talk about it in a, in a future episode. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to do some more testing here and figure out what kind of delay is needed because um, it's annoying that sound is still off here. So sorry about that guys. Hopefully it's not terrible and at least the message is getting across. So let me know if you have more questions about uh, refining curves, otherwise, We'll see you next week.